the wrong one earns false wages, but the one sowing righteousness a true reward. He who sows unrighteousness reaps trouble, and the rod of his wrath perishes. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap according to loving commitment, break up your tillable ground. It is time to seek Yahweh, till he comes and rains righteousness on you. And he who supplies seed to the sower, and bread for food, shall supply and increase the seed you have sown, and increase the fruit of your righteousness, being enriched in every way, for all simplicity, which works out thanksgiving to Elohim through us. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You are my portion, O Yahweh. I have promised to guard your words. I have sought your face with all my heart. Show me favor according to your word. I have thought upon my ways and turned my feet to your witnesses. I have hurried and did not delay to guard your commands. The cords of the wrong have surrounded me. Your Torah I have not forgotten. At midnight I rise to give thanks to you for your righteous right rulings. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those guarding your orders. O Yahweh, your loving commitment has filled the earth. Teach me your laws. Ah, Master Yahweh, see, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is no matter too hard for you, who show loving commitment to thousands and repay the crookedness of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty El, Yahweh of hosts, is his name. Great in counsel, and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Shalom, shalom, everybody. We are back from our break, and we are going to jump straight into Yirmiyahu. Remember, I already read Lucas 4 during our Torah reading, so we're not going to do Lucas 4 now, and we're going to jump straight into Yirmiyahu 32, verse 6 to 27. Who's reading? Kayla. Okay. And Yirmiyahu said, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, See, Hanamiel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you, saying, Buy my field which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So Hanamiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of a god, according to the word of Yahweh, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for the right of, inter of inheritance is yours, and the redemption. Buy it for yourself, and I knew that this was the word of Yahweh. And I bought the field which was at Anathoth from, from Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and weighed out to him the silver, seventeen shekels of silver. And I signed the deed and sealed it, took witnesses, and weighed the silver in the scales. Then I took the deed of purchase, that which was sealed according to the command and law, and that which was open. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Machseah, in the presence of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, before all the Yehudim who sat in the court of the God. And I commanded Baruch before their eyes, saying, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Take these deeds, both this deed of purchase which is sealed, and this deed which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel, so that they remain many days. For thus said Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall, shall again be bought in this land. And after I had given the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, I prayed to Yahweh, saying, Ah, Master Yahweh, see... 
You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is no matter too hard for you. We show loving commitment to thousands and repay the crookedness of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty Al, Yahweh of hosts, is his name. Great in counsel and mighty in work. For your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. For you have set signs and wonders in the land of Mitzrayim to this day, and in Israel, and among other men. And you have made yourself a name, as it is this day. And you have brought your people Israel out of the land of Mitzrayim with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, and with great fearsome deeds. And you have given them this land, of which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they came in and possessed it, but they did not obey your voice, nor did they walk in your Torah. They did not do all that you commanded them to do, so you brought all this evil upon them. See the siege mounds. They have come to the city to, make, to take it. And the city has been given into the hand of the custom who fight against it, because of the sword and the scarcity of food and the pestilence. And what you have spoken has come about, and look, you see it. Yet you, O Master Yahweh, have said to me, Buy the field for silver and take witnesses, although the city has been given into the hand of the custom. Then the word of Yahweh came to Yirmiyahu, saying, See, I am Yahweh, the Elohim of all flesh. Is there any matter too hard for me? Okay, so another wonderful passage from the book of Yirmiyahu and there's wonderful lessons that we can look at in line with what we were talking about uh, in terms of the Yovel and Yisrael was, or Yehuda was sitting here in a position of about to be kicked out because they were not observing Yahweh's Torah. We were just speaking at lunch, you know, that how Israel was sent, or Yehuda, the house of Yehuda was sent into 70 years captivity because the land never had its rest. So, you know, not having the Sabbath rests, and if you times that by 70, so you're looking at least a period of 490 years during the whole reign of all the kings that um, both Israel and Yehuda, the houses, did not obey this command, you know. Um, they, they may have obeyed it originally as they went in under Yehoshua and even under David, but when you take the span of all the rest of the kings and you carry on about a 490-year period, then it just shows you how quickly people can turn aside, how patient Yahweh is for people to return to him, but there's a clear line that's drawn in the sand. And one of the things that we take note of, the actions of Yirmiyahu here in this chapter, did not seem ordinary <laughs> to the people and actually seemed a bit offensive to some of them. Our master tells us in a parable We've been talking a lot about parables today that he gave in Matit Yahu 13, verse 44 to 46. It says, again, the rain of the heavens is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man, having found it, hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the rain of the heavens is like a man, a merchant, seeking fine pearls, who, when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, when our master was speaking in parables to the crowds, he was teaching great lessons on the reign of the heavens, which we know that reign is coming here. And even now, as we are here as ambassadors of that reign, we are to represent that reign here and now. And he spoke in parables. Now, the, the Greek word that's translated as parable, parabole, it means a placing beside a comparison, a byword, a symbol or a type. And it's used 50 times in 48 verses in the renewed writings. It comes from the words para, which, is mean fr which means from, beside, or besides, or near, and balo, which means to throw or cast. So this Greek word is the equivalent to the Hebrew word mashal, which means a proverb, a parable, or a byword, from which we get the noun um, mishle, which is the book of Proverbs. So that's why we say the Proverbs of Shalom are all parables. And a parable presents a story or it presents the truth very clearly by putting a, fle a fresh, not flesh, a fresh light on the matter as is often presented in a story format that would be known to the hearers. Something that would be understood, the imagery that's used would be known to the hearer so that they can get a lesson and learn something in order to illustrate and shed light either on as a result of past, current or even future events 
as determined by the various choices that they've either made or will make. So that's what a parable does. It, it's not only understood by the attentive hearer and doer of the word, we also told that those outside, they don't have ears to hear. So when our master spoke in parables, it was an invitation to come inside and actually, even when his taught ones came and he said, explain to us the parable. And when he, you know, and so he would explain to them because it's for those in the house that get understanding. He said, I speak to them in parables because they don't understand, but to you, I make it known plainly. And so when we look at all these parables and then these parables are still a big lesson for so many people today. And these two short parables about the field and the pearl of great price. You don't get a pearl in a field, you get a pearl in the sea. <laughs> Sometimes people get that mixed up. They're digging for pearls, but they're never going to find it, you know. Um, and when you look at this field that is purchased because there was treasure in the field, there was a pearl of great price, the Hebrew word or the Greek word, sorry, for found, as in when you found a treasure, is heurisko, which means to find, to obtain, to learn, to discover, it also means to understand. And, you know, when we see this word being used in Matit Yohu 7, our master says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For whoever, who, everyone who receive, asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be opened. And when we look at this and we understand in the world today, there's, I call it, there's lots of wannabe believers, you know, because... You know, they claim to be believers, but they're not doing what the word says. Then how can you be a believer? Because Yaakov says, show me your belief without works. Because I want to understand. You say you believe, but I don't see by what you do what you believe in. But I'll show you what I believe in. You know, there's a lot of people who are claiming to be, be believers, but they're not willing to make the effort to seek and find. And to seek and find takes effort. It takes diligence. It takes work. And they don't want to find the pearls of wisdom that are contained in the word of Elohim. And when wisdom is brought forth or presented by another, the lazy and ignorant usually pass off the one bringing the message uh, uh, as being puffed up with too much knowledge. They don't want to listen. Oh, no, you just think you know it all. And they don't want to sit and listen and say, wow, tell me more. Yahweh tells us that his people are perishing for lack of knowledge, not because anything other than the people aren't seeking it out. They're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness, and they're not getting filled. And it's because when people aren't seeking knowledge, they will never find it because you're not going to find something you're not looking for. I mean, that's an obvious. <laughs> Who says you're not supposed to open an oyster? You're not supposed to eat them. No? Because they open up on their own and you find it. Okay. We're not eating the treasures. <laughs> okay. okay, so what we take note of here when our master gives parables on the reign of the heavens and being described as a pearl of great price, this is a parable of finding the entrance to the reign. It's finding the entrance to the reign because when we think of the new Yerushalayim that's mentioned in Chazon, we see that this is described in the vision as having 12 gates, and each gate is a giant pearl, having the names of the children of Israel on the gate. Now, when we talked about earlier about not getting into arguments on genealogies, etc., well, this is another part of that, because people will say, which gate am I going to enter in? I, I, when I read Chazon, I read that there's 12 gates, which represents the 12 tribes, but on each gate, I would say all the names are on every gate, because we're one in the same, we're connected. And so the parable of the pearl of great price is a parable lesson on seeking the truth and finding it. And it causes the true and earnest seeker to sell all that he has in order to secure the pearl. And in doing so, they're securing entrance in the most set-apart place of the Most High. So the Greek word for great price is polut polutimos. It means great price, very costly, very precious. Why I'm mentioning this comes from the words polus, which means much or many, and time, which means to value or honor, price, honorable work, or even mark of respect. And polutimos is only used in one other verse in the renewed writings, and that is in Yohanan 12, 
where we see Miriam took a pound of costly perfume, polutimos perfume of nard, and anointed the feet of our master, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So it was a very expensive perfume. And the Greek word time, which polutimos is derived from, Shaul says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, and this is where we tie in with what we've been talking about with the Yovel and the redemption price. He says, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, esteem Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are of Elohim. We have been bought with a price, that which is extremely valuable. And when we understand this, we are to have ears to hear the very clear call for pure, set-apart worship, undefiled, unmixed. And when we worship our master with our all, just as that fragrance of the perfume filled the house, so too do we see <clears throat> sorry, how we become the fragrance of Messiah. Now to some we will be the fragrance of death to death and to others the fragrance of life to life. And the question Shaul asked is, and who is competent for these? And it's our master that makes us competent. So this is accounting of the cost that we are to learn, the gift of life. And those doing his commands, Chazon 22 verse 14 says, Blessed are those who are doing his commands, that they have authority, shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter through the gates of the city. So we tie in the parable of the pearl of great price, we see the gates in the new Yerushalayim, and the promise given to those who have entrance through the gates of the city are those guarding the commands doing the commands. So it's obedience. So therefore, how do you obey? Well, you've got to dig in and find the treasures in the word that teaches you how. You know, in many of his parables, our master made it clear that the field is the world. And through his blood, he purchased that field. So that when he returns, all who are in him shall enter into their promised inheritance. So when we look at Yirmiyahu 32, it's a wonderful parable passage for us on understanding that the field has been purchased, the inheritance has been secured. Our master bought for us everything that we need. He paid the price for us to be bought at a price so that we not only have redemption, but we actually have a field to work and to live in and to remain in forever. So when we look at this chapter, there's an amazing event that takes place in the days of Yirmiyahu, at a time, as I said, when these events might have not been seen by many as very pleasing. But these events shadow picture the very atoning work of our master, you know, and it pictures the redeeming work of our master being lived out. This is a living parable through the life of Yirmiyahu during the time where they're about to go into captivity. And when you consider the timing of these events, we can understand this was the 10th year of the reign of Tzidkiyahu. And it was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. The armies of the sovereign of Babel had surrounded Yerushalayim and Yermiyahu had been shut up in the court of the guard for prophesying that Yerushalayim was going to go into captivity under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And in other words, nobody liked the message of judgment that Yermiyahu was presenting. They, they preferred to have the ear-tickling messages, oh, no, in two years' time, you know, it's, Yahweh's going to restore everything. And Remember, that prophet died, you know. And they, the false prophets and false teachers were providing a false hope while refusing to give he ear to the, the clear word of Yahweh through Yirmiyahu the prophet. They just threw him into prison. They didn't want to hear what was going to happen they didn't want to hear they were going to go into captivity because they were rebellious. People don't like being told that what they're doing is wrong, you know. And this, what took place here, was a year before all this would happen. It didn't look good for Yehuda and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I mean, 150 or so years earlier, Israel had been taken captive by Ashur and divorced by Yahweh, scattered. Now Yehuda. 140 or 50 odd years later, after having been warned by many prophets, now Yirmiyahu, also warning them, refused to hear, don't want this, had their false prophets prophesying 
opposite to what Yirmiyahu was saying, and the, th the real threat of being taken, Yirmiyahu is asked to do something that may not have been appropriate or feasible given the clear prophecy that he had been given. I mean, he'd been saying, you're going to go into captivity, you're going to be taken, you're rebellious. Then he gets told to go buy a field. And Yirmiyahu makes it very clear that the word of Yahweh had come to him in verse 6 and told him that his cousin was going to come to him and tell him to buy, buy the field that is in Anathoth. Yahweh told him that Hanameel, son of Shalom, his uncle, was coming to tell him to redeem the field in Anathoth. So his, his cousin was coming with an instruction. I think I'm lisping there, what? Anathoth. Hanameel, okay. there's a couple of tongue twisters here, hey? means El is gracious, or El favors, or El has favored. Now, the name of Shalom, his father, means retribution or recompense, and the place Anathoth means answer to prayer. And when you look at these names and the location of this field, we can see a powerful message that comes through the word of Yahweh at this time, and that is that with Elohim who favors, there is retribution, recompense, in a, and a clear answer to prayer. I mean, one of the things that Shalomo, when he was praying to Yahweh and asked Yahweh, and Yahweh answered him, he says, when people do rebel and when you cast them out and when they turn to this play, pr place and pray toward your set-apart place, please hear their prayer. So here was part of this answer to prayer and the recompense that's in the master who favors those who turn to him. Retribution can have the meaning of the dispensing or receiving of a reward or punishment. And therefore, we understand that we serve a very gracious, merciful Elohim who hears our prayers, answers our prayers, and shall dispense both the reward for obedience as well as the punishment for disobedience. He does not hear the prayer of the unrighteous. So we understand while he does hear our prayers, it's not like, oh, he'll just hear me. If I'm not in him, I must realize the word says, my prayers are an abomination. But he had innocent of answer. Yes. So, because he hears everything. Yes. But what he will respond to. Mm -hmm. So the house of Yehuda, about to go into captivity for 70 years, as prophesied by Yirmiyahu. Why? Because they were disobedient. Because they did not let the land rest. And in the midst of this very trying time, there's a promise of hope that's given by the actions of Yirmiyahu. It didn't mean they weren't going to have their captivity. That was still going ahead. <clears throat> and he's told to go and buy this field in Anathoth. And the Hebrew word for buy, kena, means to acquire, to purchase, coming from the, the word kana, which is also to buy, purchase, recover. And in Mishle 23, verse 23, we see this word being used where we are told, buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom and discipline and understanding. So this is a parable, you know. The wisdom that's from above is the truth. And we are to buy this truth. And the instruction is very clear, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. And what we must acknowledge and recognize is it's going to cost you. Yeshua says he's paid the price for our deliverance, yet we must count that cost. We have a responsibility now in him that we are to follow hard after him, seeking first his righteousness, his reign, his kingdom, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And this account of Yirmiyahu buying this field is a wonderful picture. I mean, for many of us, let's be honest, if you, were, <laughs> you see what some of these prophets had to go through, how many of you would have endured what these guys had to go through? And Yirmiyahu, I mean, he didn't say, you must be crazy, go buy a field. I mean, he's been locked up. He, what access does he have? Now, go buy this field. This is a picture of belief in action. It, wa <laughs> it wasn't enough for Yirmiyahu to be teaching and proclaiming the truth. He had to live it out. He had to let his belief be seen. And his belief in action to some would have been very offensive because he's the fragrance of Messiah. And to some, it's the fragrance of death to death because some of them would die in Babylon. And he was being a very trustworthy prophet of Elohim, continually warning the people of the coming wrath 
They'd rejected his words. They locked him up. They threw him into mud pits just because they didn't like what he was proclaiming. And when you see these events, most people, you know, this same prophet who was proclaiming captivity and everyone looking on, listening to his words, I mean, you've been telling us for how long now? And, you, you know, we're going into captivity. And even the sovereign took him aside privately. You know, don't let them tell, you know, don't tell them what I spoke to you about, but please tell me. And he was straight with him. You go, go into captivity so it will be well with you. Receive the discipline of Yahweh. Now, if you think about that, he's telling everybody they're going in, and then he goes and buys a field in a land where the people were about to be expelled from. They must have thought, you got something going on here. <laughs> You're telling me to get out because you just want it, you know? And it might have been very strange. In fact, it was strange to the people, telling everybody they're about to be exiled. Yirmiyahu who's buying a field. His right of redemption to do so was validated by his cousin. You have the right to buy it. What's the point? Would Yirmiyahu live another 70 years? So in a fleshly perspective, the people living at, the, at that time must have thought, what's the point? Why are you buying this field? What's going on here? You know? And those who say, what's going on here, they're never really wanting to listen to the truth. They're just wanting to know why they're not getting their way. Yes. Yes. It shows their lack of because they also, I mean, they can also think, okay, well, we're going into exile, so what's the point of having the land? Yes. Let's just get what's, what's worth before we go into exile. You know, yeah. you know what people are thinking, Yes. but he's thinking, okay, I was going into exile, he says buy this field, which means the promise we're going to return. Yes. So it, it all stands on what, you, what you're faith. Yes. There's a, there's a nice verse in Yeshiyahu, which I wanted to share earlier, which I think is also fitting when we were talking about the returning. This uh, Yeshiyahu 30, verse 15 says, For thus said the Mark Yahweh, the set part one of Israel, in returning and rest you are safe. In stillness and trust is your strength. Yeah. And it's all about the Trusting in God, even doing the whole your vow and the mm. yeah. taking the Sabbath. It's Lord about trust. Hand, it's all about yes. trust. That's in trusting Him is where your strength yes. lies. Yes. Now, his actions certainly got the attention of the people in a manner of speaking because he literally, in a manner of, sen manner of speaking, how we'd say today, he put his money where his mouth was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Yahweh spoke. And he confirmed his word through Hanamim. Now, we have to remember that his word is confirmed to us by his favor. Or better put, his favor is to confirm to us by his living word. You know, the psalmist says the following in 119, Tehillah 119, verse 58, I have sought your face with all my heart. Show me favor according to your word. What a powerful statement that is. That's something that so many people fail to grasp because they're all, oh, I'm under grace, I'm under grace, I'm under grace. You know, we, we prefer the word favor, not because there's anything wrong with the English word grace, but I think the application and understanding that's been attached to it doesn't present the correct scriptural presentation of Yahweh's faith, you know. And so what we're able to see from Scripture is that favor or grace of Elohim is only extended or poured out on the basis of a covenant relationship. Favor is never extended to anybody in Scripture outside of covenant. It entails a relationship of obedience, and it's through our obedience to his word that we're able to see his favor, his grace lavishly poured upon our lives. And the Hebrew root word that's actually translated, there's two, in, in this passage, the, the general most frequent word that's translated as word is davar. Okay, and we're going to look at that just now. But in Tehillah 119, the word that's translated as word is imra, which means speech, utterance, command. And why I'm mentioning that, because we see this being used in Tehillah 12, where it says the words of Yahweh are clean words. Silver tried in a furnace of earth refined seven times. 
Tehillah 18, it says, The Al, his way is perfect. The word of Yahweh is proven. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Tehillah 119, your word is tried exceedingly and your servant has loved it. So the speech or the commands of Yahweh is his word. And when we think of the word in Yirmiyahu saying in verse 8, this is Devar, when he says, and I knew that this was the word of Yahweh. You know, once again, picture the scene, this courageous prophet, he's been locked up. He might have had some doubts about hearing from Yahweh because, you know, I mean, he trusted Yahweh. I mean, when he was a youth, he was told, don't be quiet, speak what, unless I break you down. So he had to maintain that courage all these years. And maybe part of the flesh might have been you know, sitting in a dungeon and he's, and it wouldn't have been making sense. How must I get out here and go out and buy a field in front of all these people? And, should, and when we look at this, he acted on belief. He knew that this was the word of Yahweh. And what was clear is by his birthright, he was eligible. We looked at the, the, the Torah this morning of the right of redemption. He was eligible to perform the rights of the kinsman redeemer. And so he does what he's asked by Yahweh, having been assured and confident that this indeed was the word of Yahweh. How many people today, they run ahead of themselves, say, oh, Yahweh told me this, and they're so confident, but it's actually the flesh. And when things don't work out, oh, well, you know, um, mm. Yirmiyahu was strengthened by the word of Yahweh and he proceeds with great confidence even when it looked like it was a totally hopeless situation, you know. And so the actions of Yirmiyahu are wonderful lessons for us even still today, especially as we consider that we too must act in obedient belief in the Master's word, even when it may seem to be the most hopeless of situations. We don't let down our obedience because of circumstances. We must let our master direct us through the unfavorable circumstances in doing what his word instructs and is confirmed in the hearing of the truth because belief comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Elohim. And the Hebrew word that's translated, and I knew, is va'eda comes from the word yada, which is to know, to acknowledge, to understand, to perceive, to distinguish. And this verb can render the, the understanding of know by experience. Now, you want to know Yahweh, God is word, and as you do it, you will know him by experience of doing his word. By this we know that we know him when we guard his commands. So the more that you do his commands, the more experience you get in knowing who our master is. And to know him applies the ability to hear his word and guard it because we will know his voice. Our master comes, he says, my sheep know my voice. They follow me, you know. Despite Israel's claim to know Yahweh, they were walking in rebellion to his word. A big thing that most people claim today. Rendering a lip service. We sang that song earlier, may the words of my mouth always please you. May the fruit of my life do the same. You've got to add that because, you know, you can say people are rendering a lip service and they were doing it in Messiah's day when their hearts were far from him. Ye Yeshiyahu 1 verse 3 to 4 says, An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's crib. Israel does not know. My people have not understood. Alas, sinning nation, a people loaded with crookedness, a seed of evildoers, sons acting corruptly. They have forsaken Yahweh. They have provoked the set-apart one of Israel. They went backward. The word of Yahweh was confirmed to Yirmiyahu by his uncle's son coming to him, his cousin, <laughs> according to the word of Yahweh that came to him. And he immediately knew that this was the word of Yahweh. So Yahweh spoke to him and this happens. His cousin comes. And I think this is a valuable lesson for us today as we take, again, note of how so many people claim to know the word of Yahweh, yet their actions prove otherwise. As they continue in a compromised lifestyle, a lawless or a mixed lifestyle, showing that they actually do not know the word of Elohim, nor are they able to recognize the truth. They can't distinguish between the set apart and the profane. And what grieves me greatly as we see it expanding more and more and more, especially as the light of the Torah is actually being more proclaimed. It's being made known, but is it known? 
because many people that are popping up and having huge groups, etc., they are mixing. And it's like if Yirmiyahu and other prophets were here still today, they'd be saying, what are you doing? Don't say by Yahweh and by Baal. Don't mix, you know. Don't tolerate it. But tolerance seems to be the flavor of many of what is understood as Torah observ observant groups today, which is not tolerable in Yahweh's eyes and it shouldn't be in ours. And so when someone speaks to the truth to those that are tolerating the mixing of evil, they don't hear the truth because they refuse to hear it. And Yirmiyahu knew the word of Yahweh and he could re therefore he could recognize the validity of the word being able to discern the word. That's why most people that hear different teachings from everywhere, they're blown this way and that way, they actually can't discern. So they don't know, is it really the word of Yahweh? Because they don't actually know how to test it. And what becomes abundantly clear in Scripture is that the title, the word of Yahweh, is a compound name that's used for Elohim. Devar Yahweh. And Devar is used in verse 6, 8, 17, 26, and 27 of this passage that we just read. And when it says, the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, that Hebrew word for came is haya, which means to be, happen, to become, in existence, arise or appear. So what's clear, as with many a time with Yirmiyahu and many a time with many of the prophets, what we see here is that the word of Yahweh in many ways happened. I always like to explain like that. Yet the word of Yahweh happened to Yirmiyahu. And the word of Yahweh is often a term as a compound title that's used to represent the physical appearance or manifestation of Yahweh to his servants, the prophets. We go all the way to the revelation of Yochanan and we see the word of Yahweh is coming riding on a horse with a sword coming out of his mouth. You know, sovereign of sovereigns, master of masters. I was going to say Elohim of Elohim, but master of masters. Now, Devar Yahweh, the word of Yahweh, in the Hebraic mindset, and especially in the Hebrew text of the Tanakh, the word of Yahweh is clearly understood as being the Messiah, the Savior that is coming. And we're also able to recognize the shadow picture of our kinsman redeemer, Yeshua Messiah, coming in the flesh in order to become our legitimate redeemer, like we spoke about. Yirmiyahu, we see that in this parable purchasing of a field is a shadow picture of the price that's been paid for us who are in the field, in the scattered field that was bought to buy us back. Because when our master was here, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. Because for a time, it was handed over to the lawless one. But our master, through his life, death, and resurrection, purchased back as a right to redeem it, because it is his in the first place, but he purchased it back to redeem us who were captured in sin and lawlessness. And he buys this field for 17 shekels of silver. He signs the deed and it's sealed. This purchase of this field as the right of redemption in the face of exile and destruction teaches us the proper or uh, power of the great work that our master has brought and brought to us in the flesh in order to redeem us from the corruption and wickedness of sin. And in Hebrew, that word that's translated as redemption, I mentioned it earlier, Geula, from Ga'al, as Eov says, my Redeemer lives. So here we've got this deed. Because it wasn't just, oh, I feel like doing it. There was a legitimate legal transaction that took place. You know, so this rebellious lot, Yirmiyahu didn't say, oh, no, I'm not listening to you. He submitted to their authority under their system saying, let's sign this deed with witnesses. So it was signed and sealed. The Hebrew word for signed is katav. It means to write, decree, inscribe, record, write down. In fact, the, the, the word for covenant, ketuva, also comes from this because it's written down. It's cut in stone. And the Hebrew word for sealed comes from the verb chatham, means to seal or fix up or seal up. And 
From this, we get the, the word for seal, chotham, that means seal or signet ring. And why I'm mentioning that? Because we're reminded of the 12 names of the tribes of Israel that were engraved on the shoham stones on the high priest garment, like the engraving of a signet, a chotham. So this is a powerful thing here. The Greek word that's used in the Septuagint in this verse 10 of chapter 32 that we've read for sealed is um, sfragizo, which means to put a seal or set, and we get a better understanding of what Yirmiyahu is being a shadow picture for us of when recognizing that our master has paid the price in his blood in order for us to have the seal of our inheritance in him with the promise of his set-apart spirit that has now sealed us for the day of redemption. And so here are a couple of verses with this sfragizo in Ephesians 1, verse 13 to 14. It says, In whom you also, having heard the word of the truth, the good news of your deliverance, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the set-apart spirit of promise, who is the pledge of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his esteem. This is Yovel language. Shaul's instruction to the believers in Ephesus, he was making it very clear that we have not only through Messiah received redemption and forgiveness, but we've been sealed with a set-apart spirit of the promise, who is the pledge of our inheritance. Ephesians 4 verse 30, it says, Do not grieve the set-apart spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, don't break the seal. So yes, we obey to keep the seal intact. So, yes, we obey to be redeemed. Remember I said earlier about Yirmiyahu, he signs the, the deed, seals the deed, and he gives it to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Machseah, in the presence of his cousin and many witnesses who too had signed the deed of purchase before all of the officials sat in the court of the guard where Yirmiyahu was being held prisoner. I mean, he's in prison and he's having this whole transaction going on. You know, the name of Baruch means blessed. Now, he was Yirmiyahu's scribe. Neriah means lamp of Yah. He was the son of Machsiah, which means Yah is a refuge or Yah is a shelter. And again, these names carry wonderful insight for us when we see how Baruch, that faithful scribe to Yirmiyahu, we're able to see by the names of his father and grandfather, we see a clear message given again during this time as a message of hope. Blessed is the lamp of Yah, for Yah is a refuge. And we're told in Scripture that yet the name of Yah is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. In Chazon, we're told that the lamb, that is Yeshua Messiah, is the lamp, and it is in him that we are sealed and find our shelter during times of distress, having the full assur assurance that our redemption draws near. Now, Yirmiyahu commanded Baruch, according to the word of Yahweh of hosts, to take both deeds, that was the one that was sealed and there was an open one, and put them into an earthen vessel so that they remain many days. Many days indeed, because it would at least be 70 years before that deed would be opened and, you know, way well, this, this belongs to Yirmiyahu. If he wasn't there, then who has the right to take it on his behalf, you know? This would at least be 71 years because it was a year before everything was going to happen and then the 70 years captivity. So, you know, it had to be put into a good vessel, these two sealed and unsealed documents, signed, signed and sealed, sealed and unsealed, yes. They were both signed, okay. <laughs> And with the two copies being placed in an earthen vessel, this is uh, going back, if we think of the two tablets that our master wrote the commands on and then Moshe broke them and had to make new ones and Yahweh wrote on them again, it's two copies, front and back, one for Yahweh, one for us. It's like any contract, any covenant, each party has their copy. And so here we see again with the two and now being placed in a vessel, just as both tablets were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, and one being sealed and one open teaches us very clearly that the word is sealed upon us and it's secured in the master, but it's not hidden from us. It's not so sealed that we don't know what it teaches and instructs. 
It's on our hearts. It's in our hearts, in our mouths, in order to do it. And when we think of this, our master said he would write his commands on our hearts and that this is a renewal of covenant. We also understand that we are earthen vessels in which he's entrusted us with his word. How awesome is that? 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, Shaul writes and he says, For Elohim who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts the, for the enlightening of the knowledge of the esteem of Elohim in the face of Yeshua Messiah. That's how we see his esteem. And he's put that in our hearts and he's given us that knowledge. This is how we see the esteem of Elohim, Yeshua Messiah. And we have this treasure, this knowledge that Yeshua Messiah is Yahweh our Savior, that he is Elohim of hosts. We have this knowledge in these earthen vessels right now as we stand. It's like incomprehensible at times, but he's revealed this to us and he's put that in us so that the excellence of the power might be of Elohim and not of us. It's not because we came up with some theory. This is his wisdom, his knowledge that he has put inside of us and being hard pressed on every side, be not crushed, being perplexed, but not in despair, being persecuted, but not forsaken, being thrown down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the master Yeshua so that the life of Yeshua might also be manifested in our body. Now the context here is persecution for righteousness sake, for claiming that Yeshua is Yahweh our Savior and we're going to get pressed on every side. We're going to get perplexed. We're going to be, you know, persecuted. We're going to be thrown down, but we are not crushed. We are not in despair. We are not destroyed. We're not forsaken because this treasure is in us. And this treasure is our title deed, <laughs> you know. So when our master returns, he knows those who are his, who are written in him, whose names are in the deed. While those who have forsaken him, their names are written in the earth because they've forsaken the living waters. This is an identity issue here because this is the treasure that we as earthen vessels, still in the corruption of flesh, have this knowledge of the revelation that Yahweh is Yeshua. And for that knowledge, you will get persecuted. You will get perplexed, hard-pressed, you know, because people will want to challenge you on genealogies. But this treasure is our title deed to our inheritance in his land. And that is the earth and everything in it because it belongs to him and, he, and he's redeemed it by his blood. We are the very earthen vessels that he's placed his word, that he's placed his truth, and, and it must remain in us for many days and be preserved in righteousness through a proper obedience to his commands. And under the right conditions, documents can be kept in earthen, ves earthen vessels for a very, very long time. The Dead Sea Scrolls that were found are a testimony of this fact teaching us that we too have this treasure of his promises in our vessels. And one of the things I always love when I think of this treasure and the passage that Shaul writes, and we are these earthen vessels, you know, we have this treasure that's in the Greek thesauros, which is a treasure, a storehouse, a repository, the place in which goods and precious things are collected and stored up. And we get the English word thesaurus from this. Our master has given us everything we need for life and reverence and what he's put inside us by his word that we meditate on day and night. A thesaurus is a great tool. You know, it's a reference work that lists words that are grouped together according to similarity of meaning, containing synonyms and sometimes antonyms. The main purpose of a thesaur thesaurus, <laughs> my tongue today, is to help a user find the words or word which an idea can be most fitly used or described. And so what we've been given is because his word is in us, in any given situation that we find ourselves, we have the right words to speak and do through his word that he's planted, this treasure that he's put inside us. And it enables us to rightly divide and discern so that we can have and be, have the life that we are to be living in set-apartness, behave like true set-apart ones in complete righteousness, even while we're in exile. 
And Yahweh made it clear to Yirmiyahu that houses and fields would once again be bought in this land. That this, what he was doing while he was in prison, was a sure sign given to them through this courageous prophet who was obedient to the word of Yahweh. While being imprisoned in the court and having signed, sealed and delivered. Yes, signed, sealed and delivered. That's it. He gave it to Baruch. Yirmiyahu prayed to Yahweh and began his prayer by focusing on the excellency of Yahweh and how his greatness cannot be compared to anything. De declaring that nothing is too hard for Yahweh. This is such a wonderful thing. He proclaims how great and mighty the works of Yahweh are. How by his outstretched arm he made the heavens and earth, shows loving commitment to thousands, repays crookedness of the fathers into the bosoms of their children after them. He praises our master for his might. He praises him for his power. And he acknowledges the fact that Israel had sinned, had rebelled against him, did not obey his voice, didn't walk in his Torah, didn't do what was commanded. And this was the reason that Yehuda was in this position. Israel's already divorced. Yehuda is now here, exile facing them in the face, armies encamped around them, facing them in the face. Yes, they were facing the face of Yahweh. And despite of all this happening around them and about to happen to them, Yirmiyahu confirms his belief in Elohim, doing what he was commanded to buying a field in the city that was about to be taken captive. Now, we can learn a great deal from this because in a day and age when the reports of many are coming and it's threats and it's this and it's this and it's alarms and it's warnings, and what are we doing to stay true into the word of Yahweh and saying, but I'm taking my firm stand and trusting in Yahweh? Yahweh confirms the words of this powerful praise that Yirmiyahu gives by asking him a rhetorical question, and he says, is there any matter too hard? For me. No. But the, I am the Elohim of all flesh. Yes. I control everything. Yahweh is in complete control. He is the Elohim of all flesh. He's not just the Elohim. He, yes, he is the Elohim of Israel, but he's Elohim of all. He's created he's all. The only Elohim. Yes. There is no one beside him, no other Elohim. So, I mean, for me, that is the ultimate truth of faith is that you don't blame other things yes. for what is happening. Yes, yeah. If you're always in control, yes. then you could rest in that. And isn't that a picture of Yirmiyahu? Because Yirmiyahu made it clear to them, you guys are in this position, and I pray to Yahweh because they've all sinned, they've rebelled. They didn't listen to the word of Yahweh. But Yirmiyahu is saying, okay, we know what's going to happen. I know it's happening. I'm not just going to give up on Yahweh. I'm still staying in the truth, you know? Now the phrase, is there any matter too hard for me, in Hebrew is hamim meni yippaleya kol daba, which literally could be expressed as, is there anything too wondrous for my word? And this puts full assurance on the word of Yahweh. It should put full assurance on the word of Yahweh in us, knowing that his word is sufficient and there is nothing too wondrous or out of this world and if you want to put it that way, for Yahweh to be able to do, because he can do anything. You know? The Hebrew word yippaleya comes from the word pala, which means to be surpassing or extraordinary, making marvelous, wondrous work. It's written in the tense that can render to be beyond one's power, to be di difficult to do, to be difficult to understand, to be wonderful, or to be extraordinary. And the Hebrew word that's translated as matter, is there any matter too hard for me, is Dabar. So is there anything beyond the word of Yahweh that's just too, too impossible? That's what he was asking, you know. And when we think of this, we're understanding how the word of Yahweh is living and active and his word does not return void. Yeshayahu 55 verse 11 says, So is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It does, not, it does not return to me empty, but shall do what I please and shall certainly accomplish what I sent it for. In Eov 42, verse 1 to 2, Eov answered Yahweh and said, You know that you are able to do all and that no purpose is withheld from you. How awesome is that? In essence, we, what we're seeing with this rhetorical question being asked, just hold, hold on for a second. 
Is that because I did this to my nose? Yes, with, with my sore finger that... Okay, we have a pausing moment there. Everybody can relax. Okay, is it beyond the power and the extraordinary and wonderful word of Yahweh? And here we are understanding very clearly that this was a sobering wake-up call for them and it is for us today. Especially in times where we consider that circum circumstances that often crowd out the possibility for the extraordinary skew people's ability to see by belief. No, it's an oxymoron because belief comes by hearing. We don't have to see. Thomas said, I want to see before I believe. And the master said, you know, you, you believe because you saw, but blessed are those who believe who have not seen. Here we are. His own family chucked him in the dungeon. Yeah. Because what he prophesied. I mean, his uncle was the king. So it was against his own family that he was speaking out. Yeah. They were the, the leaders and the kings of yes. the day. Yeah. And he still believed, well, even if I'm sitting in the dungeon or whatever, I'm going to exile all these people. Yeah. This is what Yahweh is planning for my life. It's not going to change the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's made clear here for us is that there is no matter too hard for Yahweh. He can do anything. We should never doubt that. Nor are we to ever underestimate what he says he can and will do through his word. Now, this doesn't mean we test Yahweh or tempt him in any way or try him. Yeah. Yes, and sometimes it's, you know, but it, trusting in his word is what's going to get you through. Yirmiyahu, he, he's declaring this truth in his prayer in verse 17. And it would have certainly strengthened and encouraged him hearing the words of Yahweh. You know, he would have been reminded of the first time. He was praying to Yahweh and he's saying, is there anything too hard for you? And, and, he, and Yahweh's asking him this rhetorical question, is there anything? He would have been reminded the very first time that he would have thought of these words. He wasn't living then yet, but going back in history in Bereshit 18, Verse 14, where he says, is any matter too hard for Yahweh? When was that? That was with Sarah. At the appointed time, I am going to return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah is to have a son. And she giggled a bit, you know. No, I didn't laugh. No, you did. <laughs> These were the words that Yahweh spoke to Abraham. And Yahweh made it clear that he would do what his word said. So this would also encourage Yirmiyahu. He told Yirmiyahu what was going to take place, yet he promised that he would gather his people back to the land and he would put his fear in their hearts and fields and houses would once again be bought. We have the revelation given to us, what's made clear. We know what's coming. But why is it so many people are so frantically afraid? You know, if you're not in Yahweh, be afraid. But if you're in Yah Yahweh, stay in the fear of Yahweh. And so the deed of purchase, signed, sealed, and delivered in order to be kept in an earthen vessel for many days as a proof of this clear promise, they had the prophetic word made certain. And this teaches us great lessons on the full assurance that we have in our inheritance in the Master. Kepha says in his second letter, 2 Peter 1 verse 19 to 20, it says, we have this prophetic word made more certain which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that first that no prophecy of Scripture came to be of one's own interpretation. For prophecy never came by the desire of man, but men of Elohim spoke, being moved by the set-apart spirit. And when we think of the, the things, the events that took place in Yirmiyahu 32, we once again are reminded of the assurance that we have in our great kinsman redeemer, Yahweh of hosts. So when we look at this, knowing that we're secured in him, how are you living? Have you counted the cost? Have you sold all you have, in a manner of speaking, to buy that field? Have you found the great pearl of price? Have you been seeking wisdom, getting understanding? That entrance into the rain that you've been looking for, in order to get that, you forsake all to find the master? Or have the current circumstances that you find yourself in caused you to remain chained in bondage to the things of the flesh 
and find that you're unable to see or believe the truth that nothing is too hard for Elohim. I hope that this stirs your belief by the actions of Yirmiyahu displaying belief in action. He wasn't just the proclaimer of the truth, which he was, but he showed his belief by works of obedience. Yirmiyahu could faithfully depend upon the word of Yahweh, even if he did not know or fully understand how it would be fully accomplished. You know what? I was going through Daniel, Daniel this week. You know, and there's many things I understand from Daniel. Some of the things I feel like Daniel. You know, you almost want to grow pale and feel sick and you just don't fully understand it. But that's okay because I've read the revelation. I know what's coming. I might not know every intricate detail of how it's looked out, but I know what I need to do in the master now. Yerushalayim was going to be burned because of idolatry. And the fire, this is a picture again, a pre, this is a, a shadow picture of the fire of Yahweh coming to consume all his opponents. But it begins in the house, and it began when he destroyed his house with fire. The field had been purchased, inheritance secured. This is in the blood of Messiah, and when we look in the mirror of the word, we have to ask ourselves, how am I living? You know, we are the salt and light of this world. The lamp of Yah is in us. Are we keeping the lamp trimmed through a proper meditation on his word? Oh, do we have oil in our lamp so that we keep it burning and are getting wisdom? Or are we being foolish by chasing worthless matters that are worthless? You know, this wondrous work of our master, this rhetorical question, I just want to mention a few verses where we see this root word pala being used. In Shemot 3 verse 20, it says, I shall stretch out my hand and smite Mitzrayim with all my wonders, which I shall do in its midst. And after that, he shall let you go. You know, the wrath of Elohim that's coming is actually part of his wonders. Have you ever thought about it like that? It's the extraordinary work of Yahweh. Things that man can't, you know, some of the magicians in Mitzrayim tried to counterfeit some of the things, but it got to a stage where they said, this is the finger of Elohim. We can't do this. 1 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders. 1 Chronicles 16 12, remember his wonders which he has done, his signs and the right rulings of his mouth. And then in verse 24, declare his esteem among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. The psalmist of Tehillah 119 writes, Open my eyes that I might see wonders from your Torah. This was asking to see Yahweh in his word. And Messiah comes along and he says, Do you not know that the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms speak of me? You know, when Manuah and his wife were given the promise of having a child, Shimshon, and when Manuah asked the name of the messenger, he said, Why do you ask since it is wondrous? And we're given in prophecy that a child will be born unto us. And among many of his names that he would be known by, one of them is Wondrous, the one called Wonder. Because he's the one that does the extraordinary. You know? The outstretched arm that nothing is too hard for. Twice in this passage that we read from Yirmiyahu, we see him giving praise to Yahweh for his outstretched arm and the wonders and deliverance that he has worked. And so in closing, I just want to highlight a couple of passages from Yeshayahu that speak about the arm of Yahweh. Because just as we spoke about the word of Yahweh as a, a compound title of Yahweh and a clear witness of Messiah coming in the flesh, the arm of Yahweh is also a very key concept in Scripture and it used to describe his mighty strength and power that's manifested in the working of deliverance for his people. And what's worth taking note of is that the fuller understanding in, in, in understanding the arm of Yahweh in a bigger way. Is it my light shining? No. My light shining. I thought on my glasses. I thought you'd... Oh, for you. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw lots of arm movements today. Um, the Hebrew word for arm is zeroa, which means arm, shoulder, strength, or power. And it's used 17 times in the book of Yeshayahu. And of those 17 times, 
In 13 different verses, it's used 14 times in direct reference to the arm of Yahweh. Just mention a couple of them. In chapter 30, verse 30, And Yahweh shall cause his excellent voice to be heard, and show the coming down of his arm, with raging wrath and the flame of a consuming fire, with scattering downpour and hailstorm, hailstones. In chapter 33, verse 2, O Yahweh, show us favor, for we have waited for you. Be their arm every morning, our deliverance also in time of distress. Chapter 40, verse 10 and 11. See, the master Yahweh comes with a strong hand, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He feeds his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs with his arm and carries them in his bosom, gently leading those who are with young. Our master came in the flesh. He says, I've only come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed, revelation of Yeshua Messiah. He came as a good shepherd to gather his sheep and take them in his arms and gently lead them in walking in the truth, teaching them as a good teacher. Chapter 48, all of you gather yourselves in here. Who among you, who among them declares these? Yahweh has loved him. Let him do his pleasure on Babel and his arm beyond the Kazdim. That's 48 verse 14. Then 51 verse 5 says, My righteousness is near. My deliverance shall go forth. My arms judge people, peoples. Coastlands wait upon me, and for my arm they wait expectantly. 51 verse 9, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. Awake as in the days of old, everlasting generations. Was it not you who cut Rahav apart and pierced the crocodile? 52 verse 10, Yahweh shall lay bare his arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the deliverance of our Elohim. And when Yochanan said, see the lamb of Elohim that takes away the sins of this world, it was a clear witness, see, here's the arm of Yahweh. In verse 52 verse, uh, 53 verse 1, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? 59 verse 16, and he saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no intercessor. So his own arm saved for him and his righteousness upheld him because he knew no sin when he came in the flesh. 62 verse 8, Yahweh has sworn by his right hand and the arm of his strength. No more do I give your grain to be food for your enemies, nor do, your son, nor do sons of the foreigner drink your new wine for which you have labored. And in chapter 63, verse 5, And I looked, but there was none helping. I was astonished that there was none upholding. So my own arm saved for me, and my wrath upheld me. And the last verse, 63, verse 12, Who led them by the right hand of Moshe with his comely arm, dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name. Now these verses clearly point to Yeshua Messiah as being the revealed set apart arm of Yahweh, who will judge the people, gather the lambs as our good shepherd, and he is the king that we're waiting for. You know, Yeshiyahu we know means salvation of Yahweh, Yahweh is salvation, or Yahweh, Yahweh is he who saves. And in all of these verses, the, 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 the use of the arm of Yahweh, or it brings about for us, it's very clear that this is none other than Yahweh our Savior who came in the flesh. Yirmiyahu had declared that no matter was too hard for Yahweh. And then after declaring his praise, he's asked the rhetorical question again, is there no matter to... You know, it's like Yirmiyahu could have said, yes, I already told you that, you know. But, you know, we might declare the truth in our prayers to Yahweh, but Yahweh can come back and ask us what we've prayed to him. Do we really believe it? And when we look at all these verses that are quoted from Yeshayahu about the wondrous work of the arm of Yahweh which has come and which is still coming, we are reminded to keep our belief firm and our expectation secure in our wondrous Savior as we guard his treasure in these earthen vessels by not dropping our guard at all. We also learn that we will face many pressures and persecutions like Shaul gave the encouragement to the believers in Corinth. You know what? Yes, you're going to be pressed and crushed and perplexed, but you're not going to be destroyed. You know? We've been sealed. 
And as we began looking at Yirmiyahu before that passage, the two parables of the field and the pearl of great price regarding the reign of the heaven, we've got to ask ourselves, have we counted the cost? Have we truly found that treasure? You know? And when we understand that buying or purchasing something that is sold, we take note of the, the, the Hebrew word for, or the, the word for bought, the Greek word that for bought in Corinthians, we see it being again reminded to us, as I mentioned earlier today, we were bought with a price, therefore esteem Elohim in your spirit and in your body, which are of Elohim. And when we understand this, we see the message that our master gives to the assembly in Laodicea, and it's a very live word today because Laodicea is the lukewarm assembly that we're mixing. And the word is, I advise you to, you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you become rich and white garments so that you become dressed, so that the shame of your nakedness might not be shown and anoint your eyes with ointment so that you see. What's going on here? Laodicea thought they were the people. The Laodiceans, they thought they had it all. They had an eye university where the, they, they had eye salve that was a, a breaking thing for the nations that would come there to have their ailments fixed. They had the black sheep of Laodicea. It was the highest quality wool that you could buy that garments were being made. They thought they were rich. They had it all. Their industry was thriving. But they were mixing. He says, you are neither hot nor cold. You know, you're lukewarm. And he says, I advise you, because you think you're it. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. Don't let there be dross in the royal presentation of Yahweh's word. White garments so that you're dressed. You know, and I think the difference here is what he was saying, you think you're looking at your circumstances in the physical and you think you're all made and you got it and you've arrived. I tell you, you're far from arrived. You're, the shame of your nakedness is clearly seen. You need to be sealed and delivered. You need your eyes opened. And that, would have, that was a huge warning that's given to this assembly in Laodicea, you know. And this is a key lesson on the priority of making sure that the proper seeking of the master is being done in the perfection of set apartness with true diligence and not just accepting whatever you hear, not just taking whatever from, you know, and I keep saying it, and I know it might sound like, you know, a broken record doesn't sound like anything because it's broken, but I might sound like a, a record that's on repeat. But we've got to be on guard against those that are presenting themselves as teachers but aren't doing what the Torah says and are allowing people to mix and not telling people his name is not that. That's not his title. You know? Oh, we can't offend people. No, I think it's time that we stand up and start offending people. I know it not maybe, oh, how can you say that? Because I, we ought to become the fragrance of death to death to some, but life to life to others. And when we speak the truth, you're going to encourage some, which we try to do our best at. We're not out there openly wanting to offend others, but standing up for the truth, Shoal says you're going to be perplexed. You're going to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. You know? Now this root word that we've looked at earlier for redemption um, in Chazon, we see the Greek word agarazo, it says, and they sang a renewed song in Chazon 5 verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What a powerful text because it's only, you remember you've got the this, this seal deed and the open deed. We can read what's there, but the only one who has the power to open the seal is the one who actually sealed it. And he's redeemed us by his blood out of all nations. So there isn't a genealogy that's different to that which is in Messiah for all who call upon him and are purchased by his blood. This word agorazo is also used in referring to the redeemed in Chazon 14 where it says they sang a renewed song 
before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. They are those who were not defiled with women for they are maidens. They are those following the lamb wherever he leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to Elohim and to the lamb. We're not going to get into that. We discussed that at feast times. Again, this word is used in the Septuagint in Yeshiah 55 verse 1. O everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without price. So what's translated as redeemed is also translated as buy. And the Hebrew word for buy is shavar, which means to buy as in buy grain, to bought, sold or sell. What we're given here is a call for a people to continually drink and never thirst again. You know? And what's worth taking note of in this passage in Yeshiah 55, three times we see come. Come and buy without price. Come. And I like this because it ties in nicely because even in Chazon, when the spirit and the bride say come, we also see three times the call for come. Come out of her, my people. This is a call to obedience because it ties in nicely with the instruction three times a year the males will come up to Yerushalayim incorporating all the appointed times of Yahweh. So the invitation that our master gives is come and be obedient, guard my Sabbaths and my feasts, learn how you are to walk, be sealed in me, don't put on other garments, put my garments of righteousness on you, and this is how you're going to be sealed for the day of redemption. Because his, his word has already declared it. Do we believe it or not? Are we living it or not? You know? This was a call to repentance and a call to return. And as I said, what we looked at today in, in the Yovel is the Yovel and return are connected. So this call to come and buy without price to come is a call to repentance. It's a call to return to the true living waters. As we know, Adam was cut off. And in Chazon, we see the picture of access to the waters of life, a restoration through the redemptive work that our master brought and has given access for us who have heard the proclamation of the release, are living in that release, being sealed by him, for that release to be made complete when he comes again. Field is purchased. The world is his. The inheritance is secured. Are you keeping this treasure? And knowing what that treasure is, living it out. This is the question that we ask ourselves on a regular basis. So we must hold firm our calling in Messiah, put on his armor, the armor of light walking in his Torah, the lights our path, so that his word is confirmed in us. Any thoughts on this passage? I, I mean, it's all about the Messiah coming and the Verse 6, he talks about bringing them back, and then he says, Here I bring to the and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them the riches of peace and truth. Mm -hmm. and nice. It's so nice. Mm. Because that's what it's about. I mean, talk about the pull of great price, and people tend to compromise because they're getting something for it. Mm. I mean, you're not going to compromise, you're not getting a reward, reward yeah. for it. And that's what he's saying to them. The riches is peace and truth. Yes. Mm. Mm. You know, if you if you I encourage you, if you haven't been through recently in light of this, go this week and read on from what we stopped at in verse 27. Then you see, and thus said Yahweh, never connects is gonna take you away, and then that's Kaleen saying the next chapter, but I'm gonna bring you back. I mean I'm his Elohim too. I yeah. do. I mean, yes. yes. This is my control. And, and I'm, I'm going to bring you back, back and you're going to have peace and truth. How awesome it. There wasn't, wasn't peace and truth. In, 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 in That's where they were being kicked out. No, I mean, the, the, we talked about it about, about support. In a sense, when something is, when you're uncomfortable, you learn a lesson. Yeah. When you're suddenly out of your home and your house and your nice running water and you get there, you start to appreciate it again. Yeah. It's like they, you're okay from a promised land. And they squandered it. Yeah. They gave it away for worthlessness. Yes. And he had to kick them out almost to show them what they've lost now. Yeah. You know, once they mourned in Babylon, they cried by the rivers. You know what I mean? Yeah. They realized 
what they've lost. I mean, yeah, I think that's the point. Sometimes it's a disciplining to, yes. to make you realize what you have, to appreciate it. Yeah. The sad reality that we know from prophecy and scripture of the revelation of Yeshua Messiah is that even though Yahweh pours out his discipline, there are many who still will refuse to return, refuse to repent. So, you know, let's not find ourselves turning our backs on Yahweh as he showed Yechezkiah. Look at them. They turn their backs to me and they turn their face to the sun in their corrupt worship. But let's turn our faces to the master and worship him in spirit and in truth. Because that's when we have the Elohim of truth, the king of shalom in our lives. And that's where we can understand this healing of the riches of his peace and truth. I like that picture, you know. It's that revelation of the, the contentment that we have in him. Even though we're still waiting for that day to come, we can have that contentment, that peace and that truth now. You know, because we already have that seal upon us and our reward is not in the physical here, it's in the heavens, which is coming. So let's hold on to that. We have the, the nice picture that we get from this is, you know, as, we, as you read on Yirmiyahu, most of the people that went into captivity would never see Yirmiyahu again because Yirmiyahu stayed behind with the, the, you know, the few that were left. They ended up going to Mitzrayim and he warned them about that. Yahweh says, go with them there. And then they, you know, and it was a whole big long journey. But Yirmiyahu stayed true to the truth. And the fact that he could stay true to the truth was the fact that this purchase of this land would be a reminder to him always that Yahweh said, we're coming back here, we're coming back here. And we all have that assurance in Messiah. By him sealing us with his word on our hearts that he's coming back for us. And therefore, you know what? We can sojourn. But as Kepha said, as sojourners and pilgrims, don't live like the nations, you know. Throw off the things of the flesh and walk in the light of the master, giving him praise, you know. So any comments from anyone online, you're welcome to share. I see, I don't know who else is online. I can see Joshua and Carol and... There's another Uchin Waja. I don't know who Uchin Waja is. It would be nice to know who you are. Doesn't sound like a bot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we we'll give a, a moment or two. You either send me a WhatsApp or you can type a question in the text. I'll give a minute while I play that Yirmiyahu little clip that I did yesterday. Ah. Master Yahweh, see, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is no matter too hard for you, who show loving commitment to thousands and repay the crookedness of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty El, Yahweh of hosts, is his name, great in counsel and mighty in work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Okay, so on that note, leave you with the great encouragement in our Master that he is coming again, we know that for sure. And therefore, let the words that you have heard through his word today encourage your belief, keep you strong, standing in him, and keeping the armor of light on the way it should be on, dressed in the armors, keep standing, and having done all, keep standing and praising him with all that you have. Let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless, praise, and worship you. We exalt your mighty name. And we thank you for giving us this treasure, the treasure of the revelation of who you are and the knowledge of who you are that we are growing in. I thank you, Master Yah, that you continue to increase your wisdom in us and you've given us all that we need to serve you, everything that we need to have reverence before your face, 
and let us be a people that never doubt your word, but know that nothing is too hard for you. So whatever things we face that might often feel too hard for us, we cry out to you and ask that you be our refuge, you be our strength, you be our shield. And we thank you, Master Yahweh, that we can be encouraged to lift the banner of praise to you continually as we seek you in all that we have and ask that you lead every step that we take, even in the six days that lie ahead before we come to enter into your rest once again as a people obedient to your truth. Mark us by your Spirit, seal us by your Spirit. And we look forward to being able to proclaim you wherever we are. We bless and praise you in the wondrous and mighty name of our Saviour, Redeemer and King, Yehoshua Messiah. Amen and Amen.